Hello and welcome to English Literature with Susan. Today I am going to talk about ballad. I will provide a definition of the term and I will also read an example which is going to be Edward or Edward Edward, which is a type of Middle English ballad. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, if uh, you like the template, I have downloaded it from Slidesco. And if you like my cursor, I have downloaded it from cutecursors.com. Uh, let's go to our topic, traditional ballads. What is it, traditional ballad? Why we call it traditional ballad uh, and not ballad? Because uh, generally speaking, we have two types of ballads. The first one is traditional ballad, which refers to the ballads which are folkloric. They are the forms of ballad available at the time of the Middle Ages. They are of anonymous authors, so we don't know who had originally composed them. They have um, uh, transmitted orally from one generation to another generation uh, so there are not uh, one uh, one singular compositions of them the, there are multiple of uh, manuscripts in which these texts are written and sometimes there are some differences for example in the form of the pronunciation in the written form or even um, in the words uh, that are chosen. And generally speaking, these traditional ballads were uh, dependent in memory and the memorization. So sometimes um, there would be something, um, you know, different in the memory of one, uh, one of the uh, narrators, for example, one of the one, uh, people who read or who to just narrated the story to the others, or, you know, sometimes it would have been uh, memorized differently by, by another person. So these traditional ballads are part of the folklore literature and ballad itself as a type of lyrical literature. Lyrical, you know, the term lyrical goes back to the uh, to lyre and lyre is an, uh, as a musical instrument. And uh, lyrical poetry was a type of poetry which was supposed to be accompanied by a musical instrument, most probably lyre in its traditional sense. Uh, so uh, the traditional ballads were musical kind of compositions which were memorized, verbal form of literature, and uh, they, they were most of the times uh, uh, read or uh, uttered when there was a company. So someone just made music and like, what what is sometimes a dawn today and then the poem or the song uh, was being uh, sung by the people around. Uh, so let us go to a more technical definition of the term ballad. Let's see what are the general characteristics of this genre. Later on, uh, some poets found out about these Middle English forms of writing and they wanted to imitate these general characteristics. Therefore, they are called, the, what they have produced uh, mm, uh, are called actually literary ballads. So the, the difference between a traditional ballad and a literary ballad is that the author or the composer in the traditional ballad is unknown, while in the literary ballad, the characteristics are the same, technical patterns are repeated, but with the difference that we know the name of the author. Uh, ballad, first of all, is a song, uh, so that kind of accompaniment of music is justified here. It is transmitted orally as a verbal form of literature and it tells a story. So ballads are narrative uh, forms of literature. They tell a story, uh, but the manner of telling the story are somehow different and different uh, ballads remaining from the Middle English era. Uh, about some other characteristics of this genre, ballads are condensed. Um, they, they, they do not begin with the beginning. Rather, they start with the climax of the story. So we see the climactic episode of the story. The beginning and the ending are not maybe that much of prominence in a ballad, but what is happening and the heart, at the heart of the story, in the most important, significant part of the story, is addressed and narrated in uh, ballads. And ballads are dramatic. When we say that ballads are dramatic, we mean that they are performed 
by action and dialogue. What does it mean? Action refers to the manner of the performance of the utterance, the narration of the story. Someone was at the center and then you know, reading or just um, uttering, rehearsing the lines, and then others we're listening. So there were ups and downs in the voice of the narrator, for example, and things like that. So generally, it was a form of performance, not simply reading from the lines. And by dialogue, we mean that ballads uh, were in form of uh, give and take. Somebody asks a question, the other person answers. It doesn't mean that all ballads are dialogic, but many of them are written in this form. And finally, ballads are supposed to be impersonal. By this, we mean that the narrator or the persona is not involving himself or herself in the story. So the, there are no self-references. He doesn't say, okay, this is my judgment, or if that character had done that, it would have been better. No, such a thing doesn't happen in ballads in general. There, there is just a person who um, narrates the story without any involvement or self-involvement in the course of action or uh, the, the, the uh, uh, incidents of the story or any judgments or commentary um, are not provided by that person. And finally, about ballad stanzas. Stanzas are structures or of lines in a poem, the paragraphs and a poem are called stanzas. In English, we have different forms of stanza like couplets, like triplet, quatrain. Uh, the ballad case is a quatrain. We mean that um, in a ballad, the stanzas are generally speaking uh, composed of four lines, which is called a quatrain. So uh, we call the bundling of four lines in a poem a quatrain. Uh, these quatrains um, have alternative four and three stress lines. You know, it means that the number of the stresses in the line are uh, either four or three. Uh, at the time that these ballads were being composed, uh, the uh, system of prosody and the metrical pattern of English language was not like today. Today, we rely on both stressed and unstressed syllables. But here, not only the number of the syllables are not important, but also the unstressed syllables are, um, are also not being taken into account. The king sits in Dumfrieling town drinking the blood red wine. Oh, where will I get a good sailor to sail the ship of mine? Uh, you can see that in, this lines, uh, in these lines, king sits fair, town were get uh, sorry i good and sailor are stressed um it, just to give you a hint most of the times the stress comes to the word which is important in the sentence in the meaning making process or uh, in, in these uh, types of words they in oh are never stressed or most of the times they are not stressed because they, they do not play an important important role in the course of action of the story. So the king is important because he's the subject. Sets in Dumfrieling town, drinking the blood red wine. Oh, why will I get a good sailor? So we see that um, in line one and line three, we have uh, four stressed words. Uh, while in lines two and four, there are only three. Drink, blood, wine sail, ship, and mine. And if you check uh, the spelling of these words, uh, they are um, modified Middle English. We cannot generally read Middle English unless there are some guidance. And here you know, we have a mixture of modern English and Middle English so that we, and it is made readable to us somehow. And these four lines are taken from the famous ballad of Sir Patrick Spence, uh, which ha um, happens in Scotland and it's about a Scottish king who sends Sir Patrick Spence uh, to a sea journey um, and they never come back because uh, they are prey to storms. So that was the story. If you want to check, you can uh, go through it um, somewhere else. Um, and uh, anyway, it is narrative, but it is not dialogic. It is not in form of a give and take generally. There are some answers and questions but not um, in the whole structure of the poem. So the pattern of the poem is not question answer. And well, usually only the second and fourth line rhyme. So they, uh, 
here there and the word vine and the word mine are rhyming with one another but um, the words town and sailor do not rhyme this is the general pattern of a ballad stanza let's move on um uh, and about set formulas uh i told you ballads were uh forms of verbal literature so um they they uh, were supposed to have some parts which make it easy to memorize they but it had uh, supposed to be um rehearsed by someone there were some formulae which helped that person uh to remember the rest of the story there were some there were some repetitions for example so that he or she would have time to think about what is uh, going next uh, one uh, one uh, form of these set formulae was stuck descriptive phrases, which were repeated along these stories, such as blood red wine, which we saw in the previous uh, slide, and milk white steed, for example, by the way, steed means horse. And uh, these uh, helped uh, the person who was uh, talking or uttering to remember the rest of the story. Uh, because they were repeated, so they were familiar patterns. And refrains, uh, refrain is a repeated line, stanza, sentence, etc. Uh, so that maybe at the end of each part, sometimes we have the repetition of one line, and then it marks the ending of that part and the beginning of the next part. And uh, incremental repetition. Incremental repetition is also a kind of refrain, but with a difference. A line or stanza is repeated, but with an addition that advances the story. So this is um, a repetition with an addition. So that maybe we see this in Edwards, so that the person repeats that part and then, uh, you know, utters the thing which comes next and it also keeps the audience in line of, in, with the story the audience um, is always reminded of what is up in the course of the narrative and now let us uh, turn to edward edward and if you're interested to know more about ballads uh, you can use mh abrams a glossary of literary terms which was also the source of the previous slides uh, introducing the notion of ballad and now let's read the text. I have provided both Middle English version and Modern English version so that you can have that comparative idea. Why you see the spellings are rather um, some somehow different from what is Modern English and we speak or we write today. Why does your brand so dip with blue Edward Edward? Uh, brand means sword and here, uh, the person who is the mother of Edward is asking Edward why does his sword is so bloody? Why blood is dripping from his sword? So why does your sword so drip with blood, Edward? Edward, why does your brand so drip with blood? And why so sad, gang? You uh, you owe? And you see that incremental repetition. Uh, this line is repeated, but an addition is also seen here. And uh, the mother is asking him why you're so sad. So uh, why does your sword so drip with blood? And why so sad? Go you. Oh, gang is a form of saying go at the time. Oh, I have killed my hawk so good. Mother, mother. Um, Edward answers that I have killed my hawk. That was so good. I have killed my hawk so good. And I had no more, but he Neymar is no more. So I, I no more have a hawk. And that's why I'm sorry. I have killed my bird and I'm sorry for that. But the mother is not satisfied and she keeps asking more questions. Your hawk's blood was never so red, Edward, Edward. Here, the mother means that hawk doesn't have so much of blood in him. So this blood cannot belong to, to a small animal like a, like a hawk. You have killed something uh, more gross, for example. Uh, so your hawk's blood was never so red, Edward, Edward. Your hawk's blood was never so red, my dear son, I tell the O. I tell the O shows that, okay, I'm your mother. I know you're lying. Tell the truth. Oh, 
So Ed, Edward is forced to say something else. Another excuse, another reason. Oh, I've killed my rat drown steed. Steed as uh, that old form of saying steed or horse. And red drown as a specific kind of color denoting an animal having a coat that consists of bay or chestnut mixed with white or gray, like this. Oh, I have killed my red roan steed, mother, mother. I have killed my horse. I have killed my red roan, red roan steed that had been so fair and free. Oh, so I'm sorry for my horse. I've killed my horse and now I feel, I, I feel guilty for that. Uh, then the mother is not once again satisfied. Your steed was old and he had got mare. Edward, Edward, your horse was old and you have many other horses, so you shouldn't be sorry for that. Tell me the truth. Your steed was old and you have got mare. Some other do you dree owe. Uh, do and dree means grief and suffer. Your steed was old and you have got more. Some other grief you suffer. Oh, mother, if you want to. To know the reality. I have killed my father. Oh, I have killed my father dear. Mother, mother. Oh, I have killed my father dear. Alas, and woe is me. Oh, so I have killed my own father. The blood belongs to my father. I am so sorry for that. So I have killed my father dear. Mother, mother. I have killed my father dear. Alas, and woe is me. Woe is me means that he is regretting his action. He done it, but he's not satisfied. He feels he feels uh, some kind of guilty conscience for what he had done. And what in penance will you dream for that, Edward? Edward, okay, you have done a great sin. What are you? How are you going to repent for that? And what penance will you suffer for that, Edward? Edward, and what in penance will you dream for that, my dear son? Now tell me all. I'll set my feet, feet means oh, feet, in that boat, mother, mother. Yonder, uh, to be more precise, means over there. I'll set my feet in yonder boat, mother, mother. I'll set my feet in yonder boat and I'll fear over the sea. I'm going to continue the rest of my life traveling over the sea. This is his suggestion and the answer. But the mother is not yet satisfied. She had more questions. And what will you do with your towers and your hull? T uh, Edward, Edward, towers, uh, no, tower, and hull is a short form for hull. So Edward seems to be very rich. He has towers, he has holes, and the mother is asking about the future of these buildings. And what will you do with your towers and your hull that we're so fear to see? Oh, they are very beautiful. They are well constructed. So what will happen to them when you're not here? I let them or they stand till they down for me there, me there. So, okay, they are no more important to me, whatever. I let them stand till they down for, for here never mere moan I be, because I have no intentions to come back here. I'm not going to stand here to stay here and continue my life. So it doesn't matter to me. And what will you leave to your bears and your wife, Edward, Edward? Um, now the mother asks about the future of uh, Edward's family. So it means that what will you leave to your children and your wife, Edward, Edward? And what will you leave to your bears and your wife when you gang over the sea? Oh, the world's room. Let them back through life, mother, mother. Okay, the world is large. Uh, the world is their room from then on, let them back through like mother, mother. So I'm ignorant, I'm indifferent, I, I don't know, whatever. The world's room, let them back through life for them never mere will I see. Why? Because I'm not going to see them anymore. And finally, and what will you leave to your own mother, Edward, a mother dear, Edward, Edward. Okay, what are you going to leave to your own dear mother? Edward, Edward, and what will you leave to your own mother, dear, my dear son, now tell me, oh, the curse of hell from me shall you bear, mother, mother. Okay, the curse of hell from me shall you bear, mother. Why? The curse of hell from me shall you bear, sick, 
counsels you gave to me oh the curse of hell from me shall you bear such counsels you gave to me oh the ending is rather shocking uh the mother is keeping asking questions and we see that okay maybe she is worried for, for her son but maybe that's not so she's willing to hear the news of the father's death and you no know, she doesn't know maybe why her son as doing that why her son is just sidestepping the questions but at the end of the day we see that it was the mother's idea the mother had given such counsels to her son and her son has performed the action and now the son is regretful why the mother maybe feels happy for the future for what had happened actually for her husband and she is kind of hopeful maybe for the future she can own all those tall um towers and holes maybe and thank you very much for listening this was uh, an introduction to traditional ballads and uh, short reading and analysis of uh, one example of such ballad which was edward edward